Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to another week. Uh, let's begin this time. Uh, the word of prayer. So, can any one of us, maybe Dinesh, uh, can you lead us in prayer, please? Sure, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Ken. Thank you for the new week. I uh, could renew uh, it, Father. I put all this week, uh, it, uh, the entire month, month end, in a week, in a week, uh, give us uh, wisdom, uh, knowledge, like uh, before, uh, more, more knowledge, uh, uh, bless all the students, might wings. May it, uh, your will happen each one of uh, the student. Uh, 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 so pray for pastor. We uh, uh, seek um, seek uh, you will uh, advice. Uh, I know what uh, uh, your will or uh, your um, uh, expansion, your will uh, may fulfill, Father. I also uh, uh, um, there, there are many, many distractions, Father. Uh, may all the distractions overcome, Father. I pray for entire uh, ministry, all the directors, uh, uh, you know, uh, might hand, Father. I pray for entire course, uh, may uh, finish, um, may, uh, may mighty hand, Father. I pray once again, uh, to uh, protect uh, each one of you, which were uh, including lecturers, uh, including um, uh, students, uh, give us good health, Father. Give us a good happiness, Father. Uh, I pray in might hand mighty hand, uh, mighty tame, name, uh, amen. Amen. amen, amen. Amen. Thank you, Dinesh, uh, for leading us in prayer. Uh, okay, uh, before we go ahead, let's just quickly do a quick review of uh, what we did last week. Uh, last week, we uh, continued to look at a few aspects on revivals. Uh, we looked at the Toronto Revival, that happened uh, briefly. We looked at that. We looked at the revival that happened in Shillong in India, and how you know uh, through the Presbyterian Church revival moved across Shillong. And then we also looked at a few few key observations of the timeline in church. So how uh, from the first century church reformation revival, there was restoration, there was missions, there was church growth. And then there were, we also saw that there were seasons of revival. So revival at times did not persist for, you know, maybe uh, 10 years or 12 years. It was always usually uh, a period of two to three years. And then again, uh, with a few, little few years of gap, and then again, two or three years of revival. So uh, especially we see that in the Korean revival where there was, always two years, three years of uh, uh, revivals that was happening. Uh, then we looked at, uh, you know, those ignited by this revival became carriers of revival. So many of them 
uh, read about the previous revivals that happened, read about their lives of, uh, you know, uh, reformers and missionaries and how they were able to impact society and how God used them so influentially. And that ignited a fire into people's hearts. And they themselves became uh, carriers of revival. Uh, one of the key observations that we also saw was um, there was focused, intentional pursuit of God during times of revival. It was not uh, just so we have to do it, right? Or the, the, there was prayer movements or church services and meetings and all of this, not just because, okay, let's do this, because it's we have to do it as Christians. No, uh, it was focused, it was intentional, and God paved a way uh, for revival to happen. And uh, another important thing that we learned was sharing these revival stories often ignites our heart you know uh, uh, i'm sure all of us uh, even as we were going through this especially the f from the first century to the second century church the the you know the people who had lost their lives for the sake of the gospel people who god used so powerfully to stand against uh, the systems that were happening during that time uh, and, you know, even through the whole uh, season of translating the Bible and uh, different translations going out, the, the Roman Catholic Church being against it and all of that, we see that when we read all of this, you know, even now, you know, we have different versions of different Bibles we can just take, read, uh, but the challenges uh, that people went through uh, and when we read it, we really uh, tend to, you know, uh, realize that, hey, there were people who lost their lives just for, you know, the sake of the gospel in the sense that maybe a lot of them may not have preached, but there were people who just wanted to translate the Bible. That's it. Uh, but they lost their lives for that. So, uh, so, so we, uh, even as we study all this, God should be, God will stir our hearts, you know, uh, that, uh, as we retell these stories, say, God, it's so wonderful that you use these people uh, to bring revivals and reformation. So um, let's move on to chapter four. Uh, I'm on page 63 on your notes. Chapter four, uh, reformation and, sorry, reformers and reformations. Now, all through this time, we were looking at reformers and reformations and revivals and restorations and missions and missionaries going out. Now, we see an interplay of words there. Right? Uh, some places it's a revival, some places it's an outpouring, some places it's a, a reformation, a restoration. So uh, don't worry about uh, the interplay of words. Let's just look at what reformation is. Right Now, something that is formed but it has, somewhere along the line, it has gone astray, right? Now, reformation is simply the act or the process of improving something or someone by removing their faults or, or correcting their faults or, or problems, right? Now, when we see in, uh, you know, in, in the second century church, there were new ideologies, right? When the... Uh, Roman Catholic system came into place, there were reformers. They wanted to reform what was going wrong in the church, right? Uh, they, they wanted to, you know, make things right in the church. They knew that, hey, this is not right, or, or this teaching, this dogma is not right. And so God raised up people who, who are, you know, who are willing to make a change, for what was already happening. And these people were called reformers. Now, they were also called missionaries. They were also called preachers or pastors or revivalists, right? But most importantly, when there was something that was happening uh, and it was it had a lot of problems, a lot of correction that needed, uh, these people were called reformers. So they basically reformed things that were already formed. Now, many instances, these reformers later on became, uh, you know, revivalists, meaning they prayed for, re you know, reformation, and they themselves became carriers of revival. Um, uh, reformation usually paves the way for revivals, which leads to restoration, 
right? Uh, some of the reformers that we've already studied was uh, John Wycliffe, John Huss. Remember John Huss? Uh, uh, he was put on the stake and he said, I will make sure that even the people on the, uh, you know, the farmers will have uh, a Bible of their own. So what did he do? He wanted to reform things. He said, no, the Bible should be available for everyone. Then we look at uh, Martin Luther. Uh, remember Martin Luther, he, in the early 1500s, he, he posted the 95 theses uh, in Germany. And then, uh, uh, you know, that whole uh, Reformation movement started. Uh, we are saved by faith through Jesus Christ. And so Martin Luther did that. And then there was John Calvin, uh, John Knox. Again, uh, John Knox was uh, a Protestant Reformation. Uh, he started the Protestant Reformation where um, during that time, the Protestant movement again went astray. Uh, uh, and there was, you know, the whole thing of spiritual uh, hunger was gone down. And so God used uh, John Knox and uh, to bring reformation, to reform the Protestant movement. And then there was George Fox. Uh, there were plenty others. Uh, George Fox did the Quakers uh, group. Remember, we did that where they were the charismatic movement. They believed that, you know, uh, uh, there was more freedom in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, they paved a way for their own a revival in their uh, uh, countries. And then the same way, William Carey came to India, Hudson Taylor went to China, David Livingston went to Africa. Now, all these people uh, were reformers and they were revivalists. And God used them to reform the church and eventually used them also as revivalists. Uh, uh, so let's look at a few characteristics of reformers right now uh, we can also say missionaries or revivalists but let's look at a few few of their characteristics reformers right first one they had revelation and depth in their relationship with god right so it was not as if you know these people were like okay i don't know what to do uh, or maybe they were just praying this one time and they felt oh i have to do this i have to go and make things right no, they had a deep revel relationship with God. Now, nobody will be willing to put their life on the line, you know, just for the sake of, you know, translating a Bible or maybe, uh, you know, going against the Catholic system or going against the systems that were happening during that time. Only when you and I have a deep revelation and in-depth relationship with God is when we would be willing, uh, you know, to ask God to. So it doesn't matter. All the other things don't matter. Why? Because the, the, the focus is, uh, you know, God and God needs to be exalted in every place. And so very important feature is a characteristic. They had a deep revelation and they have an in-depth relationship with God. And so this is a learning for all of us. Uh, even we as believers, as you know, pastors, evangelists, whatever God has called us for, uh, right? Go, we need to have an in-depth relationship, a deep re relationship with God. Now that relationship is can be built only by ourselves. You know, we go to church on Sundays, we can go to meetings, all of it. It's very good. You know, we can uh, spend time in God's presence. All of that is good. But the personal relationship with God is built only during your personal time with God. You know, uh, at ABC, we believe in one thing. Our, uh, you know, our personal life, our personal prayer, our personal relationship with God will reflect in our public ministry. Right? So what we do in our personal life will reflect in the public ministry. right? So we need to develop this characteristic. Secondly, they had the strength to stand alone when it was required, which was almost always because they were the only people trying to bring reformation. They had the strength to stand alone. 
they were not deterred they were not uh, uh, you know worried they were not uh, saying okay how can i go against this whole organization this one person how can i go against this whole organization they didn't think about all that remember martin luther it was just that one person he said okay i'm going to write the 95 theses i'm going to go post it in uh, the church in germany and let that spread and so he was one person right uh, william carey again uh, he read stories of uh, revivals that happened he chose india he came alone but right? he didn't bring a whole team of people uh, saying okay let's make a team of 100 people uh, come to India. We'll have teams of two, two, each, two people each go to different parts. No, that was not the plan. Right, alone, he just came and he did what he had to do in India. What about Hudson Taylor? Uh, he went to China. He again heard missionaries what they did earlier on, uh, but he heard that a lot of, lot of challenges were happening in China. Now remember that China was not a developed country maybe just like india it was not developed uh, and so uh, when hudson taylor went he he went alone I, of course there were other uh, you know leaders and other movements uh, missionaries who were there but he started on his own right so they had the strength to start alone they had the ability they had the courage to stand alone for, for the cause that they had taken up, right? Very rarely, you know, from all the stories we've learned, very rarely has somebody God chosen, like, you know, a revivalist or uh, a reformer or missionary who went, started a work, and then they felt, okay, I can't do this and came back. Very rarely, right? Maybe some of them took a sabbatical for their physical uh, conditions or for family, but very rarely we see these reformers, revivalists who went, started a work and they said, okay, we better not do it here. Let's just go back. They didn't give up. Right? God gave them the strength. And so the same way, God may put in our hearts to do something. Right? For example, it could be something small. Right? It need not be go into another nation and you know start a church. But maybe it could be just like, you know, God is telling us, well, I want you to, uh, you know, do uh, 40 days of prayer or just fast and pray and seek me. Many a times I have done that earlier on where, you know, we start a fasting and prayer. And by the time it's the third day, you say, OK, maybe I should just give up on the 10 days and make it five days. Right Now, it may sound uh, you know, silly, but it's like we are losing strength. It's like we're saying. Uh, we're not able to do it. But one of the characteristics of these reformers was they were willing to go all out for Jesus. They were willing to go all out for the gospel, for the church. That was priority. Uh, and, and we see that they were always willing to stand out. Thirdly, they had the courage to speak the truth even when religious, social, and political systems seemed large and daunting right? they had the courage to speak the truth right? uh, now remember during uh, even during the early uh, 1900s uh, the new charismatic movements uh, started people were not so uh, you know keen on all the things that were happening in the charismatic movement and you know they were saying okay why are they what is all this this is a different style of uh, you know worshiping or maybe different um, uh, the, the, the church was not like just how it was before, uh, but they were willing to stand and speak the truth. The early 1900s saw the, uh, the charismatic movement in a sense that uh, they began to speak in tongues, began to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. Now, that was not there in the early uh, church, right? When we say uh, 1500s. The, the focus was something else. The focus was uh, get the word out. The word should be preached. Uh, so all of that. Uh, the early 1900s saw the charismatic movement. They saw uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so people maybe mocked them, right? Uh, but they were willing to stand. They were willing to take up their cause. They were willing to speak the truth. They had the courage, right? 
Uh, and so again, uh, this is directly connected to the first point where we have uh, a deep relationship with God. Uh, now, if we want to have courage and be bold and strong, remember the book of Acts, the disciples are praying uh, and they say, Lord, consider their threats and grant us boldness that we may proclaim the truth of the gospel. That was what their prayer was, right? Their prayer was not, uh, you know, God destroy the work of the devil. No, he said, consider their threats. Grant us boldness that even through these religious, political, uh, social systems, these large organizations, these people that are coming against us, give us boldness to stand and speak the truth in love. That is why the disciples turned the world upside down. They were just few of them. You know, yesterday I was just reading uh, uh, the word. And I was just reading how Jesus called his disciples. You know, and I, you know, I, I'm sure we all think of this, but, but I just thought about it. God, you know, the Lord Jesus just called people. One was a tax collector. People hated them. Uh, the Jews hated tax collectors uh, because of what they were doing. They were saying, okay, you're taking our money and you're taking it and you're giving it to the Roman government. And so for some reason, they hated the tax collector. Then you got fishermen, right? uh, people who don't know anything. You know, they just know how to go fishing. Um, yet the, God gave such a boldness to them that they were willing to stand and encourage to speak the truth. Uh, the whole of the Jewish system, Judaism, everything was at stake. Even as they're preaching this gospel of Jesus, everything was at stake. People were wondering, what is this new thing? But they had the boldness. They had the courage to stand against the system. And that, again, replicated through the second century church, the third century church as well. Right? So there will be times that we may have to stand in courage. Right? Uh, somebody, maybe now that things are almost getting back to normalcy, we're going back to our offices or uh, continuing our ministry. If somebody asks us, hey, are you a Christian? Uh, do you... Don't be ashamed of it. Right? Say, yes, be bold, uh, be courageous, speak the truth. Right? Uh, and then even as we, we know that, you know, we may not know all the answers uh, in the Bible. We may not know, uh, you know, uh, from Genesis to Revelation, you know, on the top of our head. That does not matter. Uh, we know that this is the truth and we stand for that truth. Stay strong, stay courageous. The next point is they were willing to lay down their lives for the truth that they believed in. They are willing to lay down their life. Of course, now, even now during these times, we we don't see much of that happening in, uh, you know, where people are, 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 you know, martyred for the sake of the gospel, meaning, you know, if you don't give up this, we will, you know, kill you. We don't see much of that happening. Of course, we see it in uh, maybe different countries. Afghanistan saw a bit of that after the Taliban came in. Uh, they were willing to give their life, to lay their life for the truth they believed in. Right? Now, here's an important thing. It's not that they were not married. It's not that they didn't have children. It's not that they were uneducated. They didn't have any work. No. Many of them were God-used, really educated people who were, uh, you know, uh, passed out of Oxford University, Yale University. The, uh, the Wesley brothers were from Yale, uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards. Or most of them right, uh, uh, were highly educated people. Now, these people, so educated, so high in their, uh, you know, in the worldly standards, were willing to give their life, to lay their life for the truth that they believed in. And we thank God that, you know, even during these times, we enjoy the freedom of going to church and the freedom of just uh, proclaiming the truth of the word of God. Uh, but in case, going further, 
you know, if there comes a time when we will have to stand for the truth, uh, we need to stand for the truth, right? We cannot shy away from it. We should not, uh, you know, go away and say, okay, uh, you know, uh, maybe the next time I need to spend time more with the word and only then I'll be able to know. We are to stand and we are to be willing, right? Even to the point of giving our life for the gospel. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very important that we remember this fifth point. Whenever possible, they use tools and platforms to proclaim their message. Right? So we see that even in the old uh, second century church, they used tools, they used platforms, they used um, you know, a lot of their writings. Remember that uh, many of the sermons were translated, were written, and then they were translated, and those right sermons were sent to different churches, and uh, they used uh, you know open air meetings. They used uh, you know places where there were uh, commerce and business happening. They they went to those places and uh, began to preach to and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So uh, these are just a few characteristics. There are many more people of prayer, people of power. They were anointed. They didn't do anything without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, right? Another important thing is they did not do this out of the work of the flesh, right? Uh, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, he says, the flesh profits nothing, right? So even we in the ministry, we are to, you know, always do out of everything that we plan to do, do it out of the Holy Spirit. Do it through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, there will be times we have to plan, right? For example, you're a pastor or you're an evangelist. We need to prayerfully plan. God gave, has given us a mind. And so we need to put that mind into work. And then, uh, you know, it shouldn't be like, okay, God, you only if you tell me I will do this and then we don't do anything for a whole year. No, we pray and we prayerfully plan, right? On, uh, I remember you know, telling the church this uh, uh, here in our city here, I keep telling them, failing to plan is, fal is planning to fail, right? Failing to plan is planning to fail. Uh, we need to plan, we need to do things, uh, but we do it through the anointing, through the leading uh, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so today, the church needs reformers. Even as we look at the church now, many, many ministries, many, many pastors. It's wonderful. God is building his church. Uh, the, the, the scriptures teach us that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the church will grow. No matter who comes into power, let any religious leader, let any organization come into power. The church will not stop growing. That is an assurance we have, right? Uh, that the church will grow. Yet, we also need to check what is the church doing? What are we teaching? What are we, you know, uh, I'm talking about globally, right? So what are we seeing in the church? I gave you that example last week of the, the things that are happening within the church. Right? Uh, about, I think it was about three years back, uh, and you may have heard of this, where uh, there are certain churches in the West and also, I would say, uh, South America, uh, where, you know, they, they, you've got these fanatics where they, you know, they had snakes in the church. And then they, they use the use a scripture, okay, mm -hmm. God has given you authority to trample over snakes and scorpions. And so they would bring snakes in the church. They would, you know, the leaders and the pastors would play with the snakes and all these, you know, weird things that they do. And recently, I wouldn't say recently, but a couple of years back, uh, a pastor was bit by one of those snakes. He was rushed to the hospital. And when they rushed him there, you know, a few hours later, he died, right? Now, whose problem is that? It is our mistake. Because as a body of Christ, we did not understand the word of God. Right? We 
so we took these things and and even now it's happening in the church it's happening in the church right so where there is you know, snakes and all these things and uh, weird manifestations now what do we need we need people who can reform these things we need people who can go and change these the teaching of the word of god can change them right uh, so we always need reformers in the church now we may feel okay anyway the bible is released right we have enough versions of the bible the church is doing well why do we need reformers no we need reformers remember we spoke about the whole thing of the gold dust it's it's a work of the enemy in the sense that you know if it's something that is fake if it's something that is not of god we need god to raise up reformers who can stand and speak against that and and bring reformation to the church right reformers rise up and they uh, to proclaim truth and challenge the status quo uh, and they help us recognize the blinders we have up, upon our eyes so there are times when you know uh, especially in christendom they're so used to doing things right and then it becomes you know a, 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 like a blinder in our eyes now for example let me give you this example if we've been leading worship for maybe 10 years right um, and then suddenly someone tells you hey uh, can you lead worship for the next uh, 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 you know tomorrow can you lead worship for half an hour now leading worship for half an hour is not a problem because for 10 years you've been leading worship right but the but here's the important thing the moment we say okay i've done it before and right? i've done it for 10 years half an hour no problem i can do it just choose some few songs just sing about it at the moment we think that way we have you know we have not done our part as leaders because we are trying to do that you know that 30 minute of worship will be out of the flesh and it will profit nothing but we have to come to a place and say oh even whether it's preaching right can you preach for 30 minutes oh i have plenty of sermons in my bible okay i'll just pick up one no here's the thing we as a church need to prayerfully prepare prayerfully uh you know through the anointing of the holy spirit through the power of the holy spirit prepare and build the people in the word of god right there are many places where uh, uh, i'm reminded of this uh, uh what was I, I you know many years ago i i, I used to watch god tv uh, now i'm not saying you know uh, all the ministries are wrong and everyone is wrong i'm not saying that what i'm trying to bring about is even during this time the 21st century we need reformation in the church I remember watching this uh, it was on god tv i don't know which one of these i think it was god tv and uh, the preacher was uh, it was i think a 20 minute uh, uh, you know we get those 20 minute sessions and the preacher said something, said good morning, and all of that five minutes went there. And then he preached something on five for five minutes on the blessing of Abraham. Now I was a new believer, right? I just and five minutes he began to preach something about Abraham. And if you be a blessing, Abraham, you'll have Abrahamic blessing and all of that. And after five minutes, he suddenly stopped and he said, Okay, now. I can see angels around everyone's home. Uh, I can see that uh, there are the mighty move of God in your homes. So let's honor God. So everyone pick up your phones and, um, you know, uh, uh, dial this number and give $5,000. And you give $5,000, you will see your own angel standing next to you and all of this. I thought to myself, you know, I, I didn't know much of the word, but I was just a new believer, but I, I knew something was off. And then he said, okay, if you want to uh, see your, you know, your finances met this month, why don't you pick up the phone, give $2,000, then $1,000. He went on and on. 
and then he ended that whole uh, you know 30 minute session saying okay god bless you we thank you and all of that where was the word where was the preaching there was no preaching there was no teaching there was only you know do this do that do this do that and asking for money and all of these things now here's the thing when we uh, you know see all of this god puts it in our heart we can pray against you know it's not their fault it's the enemy putting blinders in their eyes so god uses reformers who will stand up against these things right yes uh, sorry i think the power went off yes there there will be times when we can you know let the people know that hey this these are things just teach them from the word of god uh, the Bible teaches us, it says that uh, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Right? Uh, and so we can tell them, hey, this is, this is what it is. We may, we may get opportunities, we may not get opportunities, but we can pray about it. Right? Uh, they help, you know, reformers help us break past the limitations we have put upon ourselves. They help us deal with things that we have ex, ex, you know, accepted as normal, but have become the very things that hold us back from going into the next level that God wants us to go to, right? And so, yes, even during these times, even now, we need reformation. We need reformers, right? Uh, so we close in this chapter it's a small chapter uh you have any uh, thoughts any questions uh please feel free um you want to share your thoughts any questions you have anybody okay uh, then let's move on to chapter five right uh now what we're going to do in this chapter is we're going to look at a few revivals and then at the end of that revival right we'll look at we'll reflect on what was the main characteristic or what was it that caused that revival right uh, so we look at a few of them uh, maybe i think it's about three or four of them uh, and so we we did look at them in the previous chapter in chapter three as well but it was just very brief but uh few revival stories draw some practical lessons and things that we can consider right let's look at the first one i'm on page 64. the first one is the moravian revival by count zinzendorf right now again once again you don't have to uh, you know remember the names and the timeline and all of it but just the practical lessons that we can draw from this right uh now uh there was the protestant moravian uh, believers, the Christians were fleeing from persecution from the Catholic Church. And during that time, there was a uh, rich man named Count Nicholas Zinzendorf, and he had a huge uh, estate. He was a rich man in Germany. And uh, many of these Protestant uh, Moravian families came and stayed as refugees in uh, his estate. And there were about 300 people living there. Now, during that time, since there were different people from different communities, there was discord among the people. They began to argue among themselves. They started fighting. But Zinzendorf, even though he was a rich man, uh, he, uh, he was only 27 years old, uh, but he loved the Lord. He went, he said, he held a meeting and he said, okay, listen, everyone, you have ran away from uh, the Catholic uh, suppression and you've come here. But all I see here is fighting and you know, discord among you people. And uh, so what is the point of, you know, trying to do this? What is the point of running away from uh, persecution and coming here and, you know, fighting and discord and all of it? So he addressed them. And then the, the people there uh, were touched. Uh, and then they, were, they all confessed their sins. They began to spend time in prayer. They began to spend uh, almost three hours uh, you know, a day praying for people. They they spent 
uh, they started a communion service and uh, every Sunday or every every time they would meet, they would have communion. They would partake in service. They would partake in prayer. They would spend many hours in the morning, many hours in the evening praying. And, uh, and this happened for many years. And suddenly during the one of the uh, communion services, there was a move of God. Uh, and there was a powerful presence of God. The move of God went and there was uh, everyone in that whole service were touched. And Count Zinzendorf said in his uh, writing, he says that it was as if we were like in heaven, right? Uh, the, this revival started with 24 people and went on to bless thousands of people. Uh, Zinzendorf, even though he was a young man, God continued to bless him uh, both financially and materialistically. And so he was able to you know, uh, sustain this revival that happened uh, for many a years. There was the, the nonstop hourly intercession that started. Uh, uh, many people from this Moravian uh, revival uh, went out and became missionaries all through different parts of the world, to West Indies and to uh, Africa. And here's the thing, many of them were willing to become slaves to reach out to the slaves in West Indies. And so that was really a wonderful thing. It is said that during this time, uh, the Christian community, they saw that there was no other community as, as powerful as the Christian community. Right. They, was, they were so loving, they were so powerful. And so the, the entire world, you would say, the globe was, you know, what is happening in Moravia? What is happening in Count Zinzendorf's estate? And so people would come from different parts of the world. And, and people from here, from this uh, uh, Moravian revival, were sent out as missionaries. Some of them who were touched through the Moravian revival was William Carey, George Whitfield, John Wesley. Uh, you know, they were all touched. They all read about the Moravian revival and said, hey, we want to do something like this. We want to pray. We want to seek God. We want to see God moving. And so they went in, these people, William Carey, John Wesley, we saw that they went into North America and they started a revival in their nations and then into England and moved on. Now, what is... A reflection important thing let's look at three things that uh, we can sum up from this Moravian revival first thing we see is unity now in the early initial part there was there was discord there was disunity there was argument strife between people and when Count uh, Zinzendorf brought that correction on the they were willing to take that correction, even though he was just a young man. Uh, but they were willing to take that uh, correction. They repented of their sins and they came together in unity. So very important. When we are able to humble ourselves, put aside our you know, quarrels, our petty arguments, our differences, and we come together as one body in unity, we will see an outpouring of God. That's what happened in the book of Acts. The 120 people, what does the Bible say? It says that they were in unity, praying for one thing. That was the move of the Holy Spirit. In the Among those 120 people, not one of them was praying for you know their family or another one praying for the sick people another one praying for uh, uh, you know samaria or... no they all had one heart one mind that is to pray for an outpouring of god in that place so unity is very important now in the church that we we see all across yes there is unity but there's also a lot of division, a lot of division. Uh, you know, uh, division amongst denominations. You got the Protestant, you got the Baptist, you got the Presbyterian, you got all these denominations, and it's causing you know divisions in the church. Oh, they are wrong. 
no, they do this wrong, they do that wrong. And what's happening? There is disunity. And as long as there is disunity, the devil is happy. It could be of the smallest of things. Oh, this church doesn't do this well. You know, they don't believe in the Holy Spirit or they don't do this. What's happening? There's division. A very important point is unity. We must come together. We should look at ourselves. Yes, we have differences. We have uh, different styles of worship, different styles of uh, preaching and teaching and different styles and essence of uh, conducting church services and meetings and all of that. But here's the, here's the important part that we miss. We miss that all of this services, events and programs, all of it is directed to one person, the person of Jesus Christ. But these divisions have caused, you know, these styles of worship or uh, has caused division among us, even though it's a worship to what, the same God. So we learn here from the Moravian revival, they were humble. The leaders were humble enough to say, yes, we've done wrong. They confessed their sins. They came back in unity. Right? We, our leaders, even our, in, in Christianity, we need to humble ourselves. Right? We say, okay, we've done wrong. It's okay to do wrong. But we go back to God, ask forgiveness, come back and you know, continue the work God has called us for. That's when we will see unity. You know, in our city here, very sad to say this, but in our city in Mangalore, uh, in India, has a lot of division. You know, people, uh, they, they don't talk to each other. Pastors don't talk to other pastors. I went to a pastor's meeting once and there was this group of people. They were talking only among themselves. Then there was the other group of people. And those two groups were not talking to each other. And I saw that the first time I said, I'm not coming here again. Because all I see is division and personal agendas. If we're coming together, the agenda should be a move uh, of the work of the Holy Spirit among our city and our nation. That should be the uh, agenda, right? Two, they responded to the working of the Holy Spirit, right? They all gathered in unity. The Spirit of God graced them with unusual experiences. They saw an unusual move of God. People began to cry for many hours. People began to weep. People began to uh, jump for joy. Uh, uh, people were laughing. People were, uh, you know, there were different kinds of emotions. And during this time, what is important is they did not mock the, the you know, the laughing and all these, uh, the, the response of the Holy Spirit. But what they saw was the fruit. They saw that there was fruit in the work of the Holy Spirit. Three, prayer that fueled revival and world missions. Again, the Moravian revival, they, their focus was prayer. They spent time in prayer. Of course, later on, they all were, began to work to supply for their own needs, but they did not forget the main thing of prayer. So there were times of morning prayers, Saturday prayers, uh, evening prayers. So prayer was a constant thing. They were fueled. Uh, the, the revival was fueled by prayer. Right? It was like you know putting petrol to a vehicle. The more you put petrol, the longer it's going to go on. Right? Uh, the same thing with revival. The more they prayed, the more they seek God, the more the revival went on. The outpouring went on. Now, this prayer did not only touch Germany, as we saw uh, the, in Moravia, but it also spread to different parts of the world, touching many churches. And by the end of the Moravian revival, uh, which lasted about 100 years, almost every denominational church was packed with people. Right? The churches began to grow. And so these three points... First one, unity. Two, they responded to the working of the Holy Spirit. They didn't stop the way the Holy Spirit was working. And three, they, the, this whole revival was fueled with prayer. And then there was world missions. So 
we leave these three points. We'll stop here today, uh, past our time. So uh, we'll pick up from tomorrow. We'll pick up a few more revival stories. We'll reflect on those stories uh, and you know, take some practical lessons from them. All right, uh, so uh, let's just close in prayer. Uh, can one of us please close in prayer? Uh, Charles, can you close us in prayer, please? Uh, anyone else, Subhajit? Yes, Pastor. Yeah. Go ahead, Subhajit. Thank Go ahead, Subhajit. Thank you. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you. Uh, we thank you, Father God, for this opportunity, for this moment, Father, for teaching us so many things, Father God. And we pray, Father God, that there be no discord among us, Lord, as, as you let us grow and, you, and as you lead us to minister, Father. Let there be no discord, Father God, but let there be unity, Father. That the revival may come, Father. The outpouring may come, Father. Father, I thank you for teaching us, for the blessed pastor, bless each of us, so that whatever we have learned, we may practice, and we, we may be able to see the reality in our life, oh God. We thank you, we give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Thank you so much, Subhajit. Thank you so much, Subhajit. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a wonderful day ahead. We'll catch up tomorrow. God bless. Thank you, Pastor.